Hello, welcome, good afternoon at Berlinale Talents and Songs from the Past, Film Travel in Time. We are very happy about this last session here at How To and one of the last sessions of this edition of Berlinale Talents, so it's great to see you all here. And we are very proud to have wonderful filmmaker Love Diaz on stage with us today. Thanks so much. And yeah. <laughs> And without much more from my side, I'd like to introduce you to the moderator of the session, Vincenzo Bugno. So, good evening. Thank you very much for being here, and thank you very much to the talents for giving me the opportunity of talking with last this evening. It's a big joy. And I think we have also a big responsibility, responsibility because if you understood well, we are the last event uh, of the talents this year. We are made a, more or less closing this uh, event. So this is also a big, a big honor. And uh, well, I would like to invite you on stage, Lav Diaz. <laughs> Hi, uh, good evening. <laughs> First of all, I would like to say that um, Season of the Devil, the film in, in competition, uh, is having a, is very successful during the festival, got extremely good reviews, as this is definitely one of the most successful films of the competition uh, this year. Um, Starting this conversation, I would like to say that uh, Lars is uh, very famous. Uh, this is not interesting to me for the long films. It's not our topic, but it's very famous also because he shoot many films. And uh, during the last year, I would so also I would say not uh, 2013. The Lullaby to the Sorrowful, to the Sorrowful Mystery won in Berlin a, definitely a big award. Uh, the woman who left won the Golden Lion in Venice. Then there was a short film, The Day Before uh, the End, and this year, The Season of the Devil. And uh, my question is, uh, how does it work? And what about concentration and being focused? Because uh, writing, uh, shooting cinema is about being focused and concentrated. So which is your secret? Well, I'm, I'm just a simple storyteller. That's the secret. I have stories to tell, so I, I don't know where they're coming from, but maybe my culture, where I've come from, that informs my, you know, my storytelling, so they, they, just, they come naturally. So you can take distance from the daily life, concentrate yourself, sitting, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and... It's, always, it's a part of my being, yeah, telling stories, you know, telling, sharing the struggles of my people. Okay. So um, I was very impressed, for example, by a critic of uh, the um, German critic, or critic Verena Lücken. She's, she writes for the um, newspaper Frankfurt Allgemeine. Yeah. And um, talking about the cinema uh, and also about this film she wrote, it's not about experiments. Mm. It's about another way to tell, to tell stories. And uh, she also wrote, she cannot uh, understand people always saying that your films are long. And I think we share definitely the same opinion. Personally, I hate the definition slow cinema. Slow cinema. Yeah, it's somehow insulting. Yeah, well, it's a label. Yeah. Just because it's out of the convention. So for a lack of explanation, they just label us as you know, slow cinema or maybe comatose cinema. So whatever they want, it's okay. <laughs> I think we talk about yeah. cinema, this is cinema, <laughs> and But it's still basta. cinema, man. it's still cinema. And um, in this case, uh, if you talk about season of the devil, uh, we're talking about one, probably the most narrative films we have written and shot, so it's not so much about uh, an on oniric atmosphere, about a dream-like atmosphere, so there is a precise uh, story. So it means, uh, what about the narrative development of, of the story? So how did you work on the script of the film? Well, doing, doing musical, it's new to me, this musical, so-called musical. I didn't realize that this is very demanding. You know, there's a preciseness to doing 
you know, uh, musical. I realized this, I discovered this during the post-production. Like, the, the long films before, I'm freer. I mean, I have the luxury of just letting it go. But with, but with a musical, when the song ends and then you have to cut it, if you have to prolong it, there's, there's going to be an, an awkwardness to it, you know. You don't want to look at the actors just looking at each other and they didn't, they didn't know what they're going to do after the song. So <laughs> there's, a, there's a discipline, I realized, to, to the, doing musical. You know, you, you're, you're a slave to the, 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 the process. You know, when the, the song ends, you have to cut it. You're forced to cut it. You have to stop it. Why there is a relation between this film and Donald Trump? Well, well, I'm sorry, but Donald Trump is a motherfucker. Yeah, so there's the relation, you know. <laughs> so, you, you know, uh, to say it bluntly, the film is a critique about motherfuckers. Yeah. <laughs> so you prefer to shoot movies about motherfuckers? Yeah, I'm doing films about motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, it's all, all my works are, it's a critique of all the evils that's, you know, been hovering all over humanity for so many, since the beginning of time, you know. It's all about that. My films are about that. So this film is a rock opera, as you said. For a lack of a phrase to use, it's a, I use rock opera. I don't know what that is. There is a love story, definitely. Yeah, there's Indeed. a love story. We are not going to explain the love story now, but uh, let's start with the first clip. So we are at the beginning of the, the film, in, of the and film. if I remember well, this is also the first song. Yeah, the very yeah. first song. And um, so the film is dealing with uh, the situation during a dictatorship or maybe with different dictatorships. Yeah, yeah. And um, the question is, in order to describe, describe, communicate, explain the historical context of the film and the story of the film, why did you decide to compose an opera? So why the songs? I know that you are a former uh, guitar player. <laughs> as a rock, a rock musician, oh. but why the song? And also, um, you say this is a rock opera, but I, I'm wondering if uh, there is also a relation to the traditional Filipino music in these songs. Oh yeah, uh, to give you a bit of a provenance to why it became a rock opera, around the last quarter of uh, 2016, I was holed up in my room in Cambridge, in Harvard, writing a screenplay for a gangster movie that we were, gonna, we were supposed to shoot around December of the same year. So I was writing that screenplay, and at the same time, things are happening fast in my country. This new president is just, just changing everything. There's a lot of, there's a spate of unabated killings everywhere. And, I read this news every day. I see my co-fellows with discourse on it. And I started writing songs about what's happening in my country, some kind of a cleansing process for me. I was trying to process what's happening. And I was like doing elegiac things for what's happening, doing some funeral march for my country. I'm, 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 I'm envisioning my country as going to this grave. So I started writing songs. So the gangster movie became a rock opera. I have this, every day I was writing songs, there's this deluge of songs about what's happening in the country. And I called up the producer, Bianca, she's here. And I told her, we're not gonna do the gangster movie. We're gonna do a rock opera, whatever. But it's, I have songs about what's happening in the country and there's some urgency to do it. We'll do a musical. I just uh, do an narrative around these songs, and she said, "Yes, we're going to do it," and that started it. Yeah. And what about the link with the traditional Filipino music? Does it exist? Maybe it's only. We the... have, we have, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even before the Spanish came, we have. Uh, we have. 
Well, when the Spanish came, we have we developed a song called Condiman. It's a ballad that's very much influenced by Spanish music, Spanish ballad, and Italian ballad. But before that, in the place where I grew up in Mindanao, we have a tradition of uh, telling stories via chants. You know, you you tell the stories, you sing it, you you create some repetition, repetitious, you know, you know, repetitious uh, melody to appropriate some lines in telling the stories, like. When uh, they do this this tradition, this ritual, when uh, a loved one dies, so the mother will tell the story of the son if the son dies, and if he stops singing, the son that the father will tell the story will, will continue the singing, and then the brother will continue the singing, the aunt, the uncle, everybody will just tell the story through singing. And this tradition extended also with the Passion, the whole week tradition of telling the story of the suffering of the Christ. You know, when we read, you know, verses from the Bible, lines from the Bible, and we, the, the people who do it, they create some tune or some melody when they sing it. We call it Passion. They have the, this tradition also in South America and in Spain. Would you say that this film is a kind of requiem? The Requiem? Oh, yeah, of course, yes, yes. It's a, yeah, the film is a Requiem for a dead country like ours, you know. But we're not dead yet. We're going to fight. <laughs> um, I would like to talk about the camera work in, in, in this film. Yeah. Um, you have been also the DOP in many of your films, mm. uh, but not in this one, not in this case. Mm. So... Uh, why did you decide to, to work with the DOP and how did you work together? Mm. What about camera movements in this film? Uh, the, the cinematographer for this film is Larry Manda, a good friend of mine. He's uh, one of my best friends. We were together in a workshop around 1986, 1985. Uh, uh, he's a good friend of mine, and he's from, very familiar with my praxis. We worked together with my first film. It's called uh, Burger Boys. <laughs> and the next work we did was Norte, the end of history. And the, the third work is uh, A Lullaby for a Soulful Mystery. It was shown at the competition here two years ago. And this is the fourth work that we did. He's, he's very familiar with my works and with my praxis. And with this film, we decided to use just one lens, the 9.8 lens. It's a very wide angle lens, you know. And, uh, you know, if you do a wide angle lens, you have to be very disciplined with the way you use the camera. Because, you know, with a wide angle lens, it's, it obscures the image always, you know. A, and a little movement, well, this is very, very, very apparent. You can really see it. And we decided to do the four by three aspect ratio. So we shot it in wide angle, but at the same time, we chopped the sides of it to appropriate the four by three aspect ratio. And it creates a surreality, that kind of very, very, very surreal image that you see when, when the image or a character comes in the foreground, it, it becomes so large, it's, 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 it's hazy, and the background becomes so small, so it creates this really deep, deep, you know, deep, 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 uh, you know, uh, perspective. And it's very, very obscure, you know, it's really, you know, it's surreal. It's hard to explain it. It has that kind of feel. And we, did, we do little movements to it, you know, we just follow some movements, but at the end of the day, we just do a static way of doing the camera. You know. I, have, I have watched the film now three, four times, mm. and uh, um, I had the impression, for example, the first time that there, was, there were not camera movement, movement at all, yeah, and, very that, static. That, and there was only a real camera movement at the end of the film, where the soldiers are killing more or less. We, we the, follow yes. the character, yeah. It's yeah. true, yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's sometimes it's very intuitive, you know. I, I we we discuss it, and Larry, his name is Larry Manda, my friend. He he's very intuitive with the way he works with the camera. It becomes his, uh, you know, it's second nature to him to do the camera works so when. So he just, you know, he's free to do the movement anyway. I tell him, if the the actor moves, just follow him if you want. But if you want to stay, stay there, you know. So he's free, yeah. So he's a friend. He's a friend with your eyes. Oh yeah, yeah. he knows my process. So yeah, yeah. And with that, that ending, that ending scene, because it's only one take, and it was very difficult because uh, it's very tight, and we didn't realize that. Pillow, the actor will crawl. We we thought this is gonna stay there, and when he crawled, it's good thing that Larry followed him, and it created that you know uh, different resonance. Yeah. Uh, we can start now with the second clip, please. So this film is a love story, but it's also a story of a separation. Mm. Because, uh, and this is a story about idealism, idealism. She, yeah, she's a young doctor. She yeah. decides to go to, to the countryside to work as a doctor. Are you dealing with a real story? And also, if we yeah. talk about the other characters, we are talking about real existing characters yeah. of the time. Yeah, during that period, uh, we have groups of doctors, young doctors especially, they, they have this movement called Doctors to the Barrios. So th once they graduate from college, they serve, you know, in the communities two years before they would, you know, seek, you know, some money to survive. But it's, it's you know, it's sacrifice. And most of them, most of, who do, most of them who do that are activists at the same time. So there's this greater idealism, you know, to serve and also to save the country. So there's a lot of them. They become victims to, especially with the, with the proliferation of militias in the villages, you know, they become victim, victims to rape, you know. I think, um, I, I think this, this clip is also very important in order to understand that um, violence at this time was not only about killing, Torturing, but it was a lot about intimidation, so about creating an, atmos an atmosphere of constant fear. So it was yeah. fear, typical fear. for the time. It's about fear, yeah. You, you intimidation through fear. So you, you silence people through that. You know, you know. I, I grew up in a place like that, in a very remote village in the southern part of the country, in Mindanao, in the, the provinces of Mindanao. We were militarized and. I, I, I see this, this, this uh, volunteers, doctors, the barriers, most of them, you know, they live in fear, they were intimidated, you know, this, I've seen this, I'm a witness to this, you know, to this. I'm, I'm very familiar with these things, yeah. Uh, please, the third clip. <laughs> la, la, la. I think it is a great moment of the film, a very important one also, because um, you, you describe how the, the fascists, the, 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 the soldiers, they are trying to morally justify, justify their actions. So they try to find a devil, they try to develop a kind of more, a new morality. Yeah. And so it's, it's pretty strange to us, watching, for me, for example, to, to watch this, uh, this um, episode. But um, this kind of moral strategy was also a particularity of the, this dictatorship uh, at this time? Yeah, it's, it's a very, a very, you know, it's always there. It's inherent amongst, you know, dictatorship or despots, you know, or fascist movements, you know, the way they rationalize their deeds, you know, the way they impose, you know, what they think is right, the, the way that they impose their perspective. It's always, there's this very fascistic, you know, the age of repetition, 
the age of conditioning, you know, the, they don't, you know, how, how do you describe a fascist? A fascist is a person who is so self-absorbed, so self-centered, so he only listens to himself, what he thinks is right, and, and that's Hitler. That's Duterte, that's Trump, all this, you know, that's Putin. You know, we don't have to go far. We just look at Assad. We just look at the regime in Myanmar. You, we just look at the military establishment in Thailand, and we see that they, they have the same faces, you know, they have the same demeanor, they have the same attributes. Uh, the next clip is also about fascism. I can, we can call it for, uh, talk for after the clip. When, uh, when I did that, when I was trying to conceptualize the scene, I was thinking of what's going to be the ultimate fascist ritual. So you think of how Hitler, you know, indoctrinized, you know, how he tried to sow, you know, all this you know, very demigod-like uh, bombardment with the youth in Germany, the same way Mussolini, you know, all those guys, you know. So it's, it's ritualistic how you create a persona to become godlike and you know, beyond, you know. Because it seems that Chairman and Caesar is a kind of a new messiah. For yeah. there, there's a kind of a religious attitude. Yeah, but we can always go back to, you know, you know just say it straight. He is Duterte, he is Marcos, he is Hitler, he is Mussolini, he is Azad, he is, you know, Putin. All these motherfuckers, yeah. yeah. And, and the, the soldiers in the, in, in the film, they're always talking about starting a new religion. So it's, yeah, they, you know, populist movements, demagoguery is about that, creating new perspectives, new beliefs, new churches, you know. It's, you know, the discourse on myth-making always. You, you, you create some apocryphal perspective on a certain persona and it becomes the truth after a while and it becomes a god. That's the very, very fascistic of creating a leader, you know, like Hitler, you know. So it's very interesting because uh, there is a speech, he has a speech mm. talking about, I don't know, but there are not subtitles. And obviously yeah. this is a, a what, what we did there was that I, I took some, oh, some of the speeches of Marcos, I mixed it with the speeches of Duterte, I reversed the words and I asked the actor to memorize it in reverse and I asked him to, <laughs> and I asked him to do it like, a rap thing, staccato and high pitch, and he did it well. <laughs> he did it so well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those are speeches by Marcos and Duterte. So it's also a very ironic point of view. Yeah. Yeah. You don't really understand them, right? But they're so ecstatic about what they do. You, know? yeah. you, you, you have orgasm, but you don't understand why. That's ecstasy, you know, with, you know, without understanding what's happening. Okay, thank you very much for the next clip. It's a very short one. Now. Well, why did you choose that? So I have chosen this, uh, this clip because uh, two days ago during the press conference, a, a German journalist, it's, it's important German oh, in this I case, <laughs> starting saying uh, it looks like a cliché. Uh, yeah. Because she was thinking about uh, a famous painting in, 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 in ah. Germany, uh, um, a, a painting of the late Romanticism called The Poor ah. Poet. Well, that's the problem of referencing always. Yeah, yeah but it's, you get to judge things. It's completely like wrong. I yeah. don't agree at all. I'm, I'm in love with this, mm. with this, with this sequence because uh, I really like the essentiality, the perspective of the shot, the light. Mm. the space, mm. and so what, what about, about the light and the space and the space well, in this? With, with this scene, it's, it's a very transcendent scene because this is the moment where the poet, the, the, the professor, 
this activist has finally come to terms with th what he can do. You know, he started writing again, and he started chronicling what's happening again. He started to, you know, to come to terms with what can, he can do. It's just a reawakening, you know. That's just the sin. It's a simple sin. And with the lights, we're just free to do it anyway, so it's very expressionistic. There's no electricity in the barrio, but we just, just flood the, light, the places with, you know, what we can have, you know. We just throw some lights there, so just to illuminate, uh, you know. It can, it, can, it can have many, many meanings. It can control anything that you can, you know. It's experiential anyway. Cinema is like that. Thank you very much for the last clip now. Why, why, why did you choose that, Vincenzo? Why? Why did you choose that? Well, f definitely because it's about uh, the light, is one of the main characters of the film, and also because uh, um, with, this, with this painting or with this sequence, oh, you're really telling many different stories. Mm. Last but, on, but not least, the story of the cat. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so let's talk about the light again, because uh, it's very impressive, and the light, yeah. this kind of light, is playing an extremely important role during the four hours of the film. Oh, it's very expressionist, like, it's very much influenced by the, the German expressionist movement, you know, you borrow these things, but this is the key moment of the film where, you know, the character sees the light, you know, literally you see the light, but at the same time, she's now free. She's gonna, you know, face his fate. She's gonna face the truth now. She's gonna sacrifice his life. This, is in a more, you know, a more lofty term, it's, this is liberation time. This is emancipation time for him. You know, it's it's okay that he dies, but at the same time, he wants to see the truth. Is the moment, and he knows what's happening in his country. He's embracing that moment. And he's gonna give his soul for that. Yeah, is the moment. And there's this when we did this scene. It's very magical. You know, uh, there are many elements that come that we didn't, you know, really impose on the scene. Because like the cut coming in, we shot the film in Malaysia. In Filipino, halimau is devil. In Malaysia, Halimau is cat, you know, tiger. And the cat comes in and it's like, oh, what's happening? So, you know, the magic of cinema. <laughs> you see these things, it just happened, you know. Okay, thank you very much, love. Maybe we can start with our Q&A. I don't know if you have already many questions. There is a question in the dark on the right side. Like this? Okay. Um, first of all, thank you. Uh, was really you can also ask questions with the cast and the crew. They're here. They're, they're great minds, you know. <laughs> they're here. You can ask questions. Thank you. Um, first of all, it was really beautiful how you put it this together. And I was really touched because you're talking about the history of your country, but it was a, a mirror to my own culture. Like, I come from Peru. And we had also a violent time in the 80s, 90s. We were under a dictature. It was exactly how people lived that. And I was really impressed how this bond is so similar. Like the power, like the, the control, the, the violence, like this kind of uh, religion. This We had also this terrorist group it was uh, the, the direct director of that was also seen like a like a godness and we never spoke so open like this in my country and I think it's the problem and we should do more things like this. Yeah. I think that heals a lot. Thank you. Yeah, there's, there's an urgency now. We should move, you know. Cinema must be that now. We need to be engaged. We need to use the medium to, you know, to engage all these evils in our societies, the syndrome, 
you know, this is the 21st century. We couldn't wait. We should, you know, use everything. If you're a poet, write poems to engage things. You know, if you're a filmmaker, do it. If you're a dancer, use your movement to, you know, appropriate or to to push changes. So it's there's an urgency now. This is the 21st century, and humanity is just sinking and sinking. We need to save it. Yeah. Um, there is a question there. Okay, <laughs> Love, thank you for this film. We saw it this morning. That's a great And having the, the la 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 in our heads for the entire... You're beside, you're beside the militia. La 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 <laughs> la, <laughs> la, <laughs> la la <laughs> So it haunts you and it is uh, at the same time beautiful and at the same time thank you. confrontational because you are uh, in empathy uh, with, um, with the moment of, of so much rage and um, injustice confronting the militia, the soldiers. And then you, you choosing it as kind of this connecting point that's, that suggests even in terms of musical terms and, and harmony, there's something in unison with both, which probably is a device to make you even more angry to a certain extent. Um, you, the, or one, the viewer, because you are being more puzzled by the fact that there is a musical harmony within the oppositions. I noticed that in one or two occasions, the, the, when they are also harmonizing the, the melody with second and third voice, uh, there are some moments where it goes into a disharmony. Of where, it's not, <laughs> where it's now the question, it, That's is part it of the, the actors plan. or is it... <laughs> but could you talk a little bit about exactly this concept of, of harmony yeah. and what is going on between these oppositions in this moment? Uh, right on, from the very start, we, we did away with the usual artifice or adornments of the musical as we know it, the genre from Broadway to Hollywood to all the, the Bollywood, you know. You know, the usual musical, the, the conventional musical is, there's so much manicured, you know, arrangement, instrumentations, and this per perfect pitch, perfect voice, perfect harmony. With this film, it's just, I just want to be primal. Mm -hmm. If you're discordant, if you're out of tune, it's okay. It just has got to be primal, just as long as it's, it's from the soul, it's more important, you know. I did away with those adornments. Less movements, you know, less adornments, you know, diegetic in a way, and that's it, you know. It's anti-music, that's why the producer called it anti-musical. There is a question there first. Oh, <laughs> I hope it's chocolate. Um, I like the definition rock opera. And while I was watching this, I was wondering, <clears throat> opera is the opposite of pop, and rock is pop. And I don't know, it, it reminds me, you know, this, I mean, what I'm trying to ask is how has been this film seen by the general public and what is the feedback that you are receiving from uh, people who are not experts who are, or are not like highly intellectual? Because, okay, for me it's beautiful and I really enjoy it, but have you, what is the feedback that you have received from the, the, the let's say, the medium average um, citizen <coughs> of your well, country or the hmm. other country and, and how much was it in your mind to create something so alternative and so unique while at the same time trying to talk about something that I believe you, you want to reach as many people as possible with this film? So I'd like to know about this crazy mix of things, rock, opera, experimental, pop. 
Well, with your first question, this is just the world premiere, so it's just here. It's just Berlin anyway. We don't know yet what's going to be the general reaction. But uh, yeah, just to negate what you said that rock is pop and, you know, rock is encompassing now, you know. The, the way you make love with your wife or with, with your mistress or with your uh, partner is rock and roll. So <laughs> everything is rock now. Yeah. It's pop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the last question that you said about reaching the popular mass, I don't think about that. Just as long as the work is responsible, it's going to be there. One day they're going to find it anyway. So, yeah. But to be honest, if, if we can add something, uh, it would be very interesting to show this film in, in, in the location. Yeah, definitely, of the, definitely. Because I don't think it, they, I think they would, they would understand the film because it's also a very emotional film. It's, it's linked to the personal history, to the personal history maybe of the yes, family. That's very so true. You can act. The film is very sentimental, very melodramatic. The narrative is very direct. Even the perspective of the film, it's, it's, it's the closest that I get to doing a propaganda work. It's a direct critique of this motherfucker. So, <laughs> so it's, it's easy to get it. Yeah. The reason because when I, 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 I read this article in, in the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, mm -hmm. but I was very impressed it's because she said she, loved the she loves the film, saying this film is not an experiment. Yeah. yeah. yeah just because we negated all the adornments of musical, that you, you think it's very alternative? No, it's not. It's very conventional in a way at the end of the day. Yeah, if you have more questions. Uh, I would like to ask you something. Um, there is any link uh, with your previous movie? Because in your previous movie that you showed in Venice, that I like very much, uh, you... You don't like this film? Yes, yes, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, but Venice is my city. Let's, let's, so drink, let's drink later. Yeah. yeah, Venice is my city, so uh, you won uh, in Venice. And um, I see also here a uh, same red line, uh, that it's uh, the powerful man who is taking advantage of his role and uh, is doing something to the... Uh, the poor, and uh, I would like to know your opinion about the link between this film and the other one that you with, presented in Venice. With the past works. Yeah. Well, I, I consider my works as just one film anyway. That's it. I, I, don't, I don't see a difference between my first work, which is Burger Boys, the criminal of Barry Concepcion, but on West Side and extends to the 11 hour film. They're just one work. It's the work of one, you know, one bum. You know. So it's my view of the world. I hope I can share something, yeah. Um, yes, I would also like to thank you very much for this wonderful film and I would uh, like to also, since you gave the opportunity to uh, ask a question to you as well as to your crew, um, Referring also to the music in, in German, there is a poem, a short poem, which goes like, um, wo Musik ist, da lass dich ruhig nieder, böse Menschen kennen keine Lieder. So, uh, like translated, where there is music, you can settle down, uh, evil people do not know music, or uh, evil people do not know any songs. So I would uh, like to ask you, in, um, in terms of directing the actors, but also the actors, how it was to um, well, particularly to the actors who played evil people, how it was to play the evil people by the means of music. Was music a way kindling the evil even more, or was the music something which you had to surpass to be very evil, so to say? Well, I don't um, know how do you say that. As, he's, as he, he's Joel Sarat, so he played the snake. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Um, from, from my end, I, I, I approach the songs as my dialogue, as, as a text to, supposed to have been spoken by the character. And, um, 
Yeah, I think that's, that's just about it. That's the whole uh, approach to using the song. Other actors here? Bart. Bart. <laughs> he played the wise man, Baham. Yeah. Bart. <laughs> I think, I think your question has to do with, uh, what you're saying is that um, the, the evil men don't sing. Is that, is that right? Yeah, there, there's no music for evil people. Yeah, um, and, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, um, the most melodious uh, pieces, I think, were sung by the good people in, in the film. The, the most repetitive and uh, maddening, actually, were the ones that were given to the, to the bad guys. <laughs> uh, and, and even the dissonant ones, the dissonant um, tunes, were mostly uh, sung by the, the bad guys. So, so I think there's something there. Lilet, uh, one of the militias, Lilet Rios. I think even the devils can sing because it's a way to charm. And even when Marshall was declared, I remember I was a kid, there was an anthem that was sung about the new society. So it, the way we sing Lala, that reminded me of that anthem that television stopped, I missed my cartoon, and this suddenly this new society anthem, so Orwellian played, so devils can sing. Yeah, Evo is, you know, very much attached to psychosis. There's no remorse, there's no guilt, there's no soul. It's just dead, you know. But they can't play around us, you know. There is the official <laughs> Hello? Hello, oh, yeah. Um, I have a question uh, concerning uh, your uh, cinematic uh, inspirations. Um, I don't know your work too well because the films are not easy to see in Germany, but uh, I have seen enough to see a connection to um, the cinema of Tio Angelopoulos and uh, Miklos Jankso, the Hungarian master who, who died a few years ago, because um, your mise-en-scene is very much um, a choreography um, and it has a dance-like quality to it. Um, while the camera, while the camera shots are still composed, but um, there is not much camera movement. The movement is always internal um, mm. by the actors. So this reminds me very much of Angelopoulos, um, okay. Young Show. Um, is there a connection? Are you? Yeah. yeah, I'm a fan of Theo, and I had a chance to be a friend of Theo during his last year. I work with him in Thessaloniki with, with, with the festival where he was the head of the jury and we became very good friends. He invited me to stay in his house in Athens. But before that, I've known his works. I, I was a big fan. The, the very, very distinct quality of Theo's work is his humanity. He understands humanity deeply. There's an earnest and a profound understanding of what's a human being. That's Theo's work. I love his work so much. I was very much influenced by his works, just like Tarkovsky, just like Broca, you know, Country, or, you know, uh, Brisson, all those guys. Uh, sadly, when he invited me to live, to stay in his house in Athens. He died in a motor crash that year. I was on the way to Europe that year, and I was in this airport, and I saw this news that he died in a motor crash. It was very sad. We didn't get a chance to be together again. But he is great, you know. He's a good friend. He was a good friend, yeah. I love his works, yeah. Thank you. I have one more question uh, concerning your um, cinematography. Um, oh, yeah. I was very excited um, to read um, that you shoot uh, on very small cameras, actually. Um, um, yeah, um, digital 
yeah. uh, devices. Um, I'm using cheap cameras. You know. Yeah, and that was really empowering for the, the, the one that <laughs> won in Venice. I use the Sony A7S II. Yeah, yeah. I, I was always telling this story when we got the lion, and there's this press conference, of course, and this Hollywood guy was sitting beside me, and this huge, uh, you know, you know, egoistic guy from Russia sitting beside uh, on my left side. All these big directors, and they were talking about their big cameras. And when some, <laughs> some earnest journalist asked me, what camera did you use? I used this very cheap A7S II camera, which is just $2,000. And it was like, there was silence for like five seconds, maybe. Like, they, they, didn't, they didn't want to look at me. <laughs> you know, I, I look like shit to them. Why did you use that camera? You know, you know cinema is not about expensive cameras. It's not about expensive equipments. It's not about big budgets. It's just about your soul. It's just about your humanity. It's just about your understanding of life. That's cinema. It has, not, it has got nothing to do with big budgets. That's motherfucking Hollywood, you know, expensive movies. You know, you can put the fingers to them. Cinema is just simply being zen about life. There is a question there on the, my left side. So uh, thank you very much uh, for the movie. Um, I was in the press conference and I asked you about your biggest love story of your life. And you're back, you're back. Uh, yeah, I just started talking about Donald Trump and love stories with Donald Trump and I was like, okay, I don't understand anything. Um, Anyway, I congratulate you for the movie before watching the movie. Welcome. Uh, because I knew I was going to like it. And the thing about the love stories is because for me, um, one of my biggest love stories began with you two million years ago with these guys. We meet in Liabi movie. And since then, um, I mean, we follow you and we meet every Berlinale and, and so on. And well, that's actually not a, a question I'm not going to ask you again because I'm not going to get an answer about Donald Trump again. So um, the question was about the Narciso and why he got this second face here. Mm. And I understood that like the two faces of the dictatorship, but I'm not sure which two faces are these ones, if well, that's it's, the it's, answer. Which a representation of all these demagogues, these you know, despots, you know, fascists, you know, dictators, they're the same. They can only see themselves, they're self-absorbed, they're self-centered. They don't listen to other people's voices. They just listen to their voice, you know. We, we borrowed that from the Western, you know, mythology, of course, Janos, you know, the Janos face guy, or Narcissus, for that matter, which is from Narcissus, from, you know, the Greek mythology. It's, it's all about that. Demagogues don't listen to us. People, they just listen to their egos, to their, you know, to their, you know, inner selves. You know, it's it's very very subserving. Very, so it's all about self-interest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to you and to all of your crew for uh, wonderful and very strong work. And I have two questions, if I may. First is um, about this woman who sings together with the main protagonist or sometimes instead of him sitting next to him. Uh, and I wanted to, to ask you to tell a little bit, to talk a little bit, what is your thinking uh, behind her character and why she is a woman? And the second question may be to you or to anyone among the crew who would like to answer. In the film, uh, your protagonist sing a lot about hope, that one day masses will revolt and justice will come, but how events unfold, it's pretty hopeless. <laughs> and it's a very strong statement that it's pretty hopeless. And my question is, do you have hope? <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. well, do you have hope? 
Do you still have hope? Yes. Yeah, uh, Frederick Nietzsche said, <laughs> hope is a bad word, so. But it's still a good word, you know. We, we can, you know, we can, we can, you know, it's, it's important what we, you know, we will maintain that hope, you know. If we, we become skeptics or pessimistic or we become very, very negative, then we're gonna lose not just our humanity, we're gonna lose the world, you know. Anyway, your questions about the, the, the first two questions, the, 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 the person who acted the, with the, he's, he's here? Mm -hmm. You can answer that. Between us, it's not here. Between the, the storytellers, it's not here yet. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, the film is very conceptual. So it started that way. So we're free to do things. Like the head of the military was played by a woman actor. She's here, Hazel Lorenzo. So, um, and we. There are a lot. There are a lot of. There are a lot of referencing to the Malay pagan folklore, like Aha Snake, is here or Paham, which is the wise man in our folklore. Before the Spanish came, we have this, you know, you know, these images in our culture. So, it's good to use them with cinema. You know, it's good to use them, and we borrowed some, you know, referencing. We reference also some. Western mythology, the Janus face guy, you know, the Narcissus guy. So you can mix this thing. And it's also Brechtian, you know, Bertolt Brecht's, you know, way of doing, you know, dramaturgy. It's always there. You, you, you mix these things. And of course, rock and roll. There's a question there. Yes, uh, the, yeah. the, 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 the mic. Maybe someone can. The bowl. <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> That's the big question. <laughs> We're still relatively safe because they, they didn't see the film yet. So we, we hope, you know. <laughs> the guys here can answer that as well. You, you can ask questions from them. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I have another question. Uh, can you tell us a bit about uh, rehearsals and uh, shooting time, actually? That would be interesting. Um, how often do you go through your rehearsals or is it just the first take? How many takes do you usually have or in this movie? Yeah. We, for this film, I, weeks before we started shooting the film, we sent the, the you know, the so-called uh, demos. I recorded the songs in front of the camera, the GH4 Panasonic, and we sent the songs to them. So it's, it's all very instructional. Memorize the songs and we'll do this during the shoot. So during the shoot, we did a bit of rehearsals, you know. We, we always do, our, our process is we, we give them the script the night before that or the day of the shoot. And you know, these are very, very great actors. They're, these are great actors and you know, they prepared well, yeah. The question, there was a question hidden in the back. The mic? Ah, you would like to add something? Okay. Hi. Um, yeah. Um, are you not afraid to speak about this and also to your crew to be involved in some, this kind of um, speak up um, films and mm. particularly now that you say that in, in your countries again, like? Yeah. Uh, this is the 21st century. Of course, I have fears, but this is the 21st century. We should speak up, it's so urgent now. You know, we don't, right this very moment, some Libyans are drowning, crossing the, the ocean, going to Italy, you know. Refugees are dying of hunger and cold in Syria and in other parts of the world. There's an urgency to say things. You know, we should obscure or destroy the wall of fear now. We just speak out. There's no more time. You know? I don't know why. Why there's still this, you know, 
wall of fear. We should destroy it now. This is the 21st century. And my question will be very uh, close to, to the one of the last person. Uh, is your movie uh, already distributed in the uh, Philippines? What's that? It, is your movie already distributed in the Philippines? Mm. The word distribution is... <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it's poison. <laughs> <laughs> it's so greedy. It just, there's this profit motive behind it. And, uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, the thing with... Uh, we're still very free in the Philippines anyway. We can still speak. We can still have forum for our whatever we want to do. But the, of course, this is this hovering fear that, you know, you're going to be the next target. Because this government is very vindictive, very vengeful. You know, it's very, they couldn't take criticism. They couldn't take opposition. So it's very, very dangerous at the same time. So yeah, but you know, just like what I told her, there's an urgency now, you know, you know, just push the fear away, just do it, yeah. Do we have other questions? Maybe we have time for the two last questions, this one. <laughs> I love this object, it's this a word. <laughs> it's a chocolate. Thank you uh, for your beautiful film. Um, it reminded me a little bit of Joshua Oppenheimer's The Act of Killing, which also deals with genocide yes. uh, in Indonesia, and also a very similar um, genocide as I, I recognized it because it's a conjuring of ghosts of the devil. Jo Joshua is doing a musical now. He's uh, exactly, and he's, he's now a doing good a friend. musical. Yeah. Oh, okay, I just wanted to ask you if and you. It's, it's about okay. Duterte. Oh, great. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit more about your f friendship? Or, um... Well, uh, he was part of the jury when I won the Venice yeah, okay. uh, Lion, and we're, we're communicating, and we're, we're good friends. And we, he did a lot of the research on what's happening in the Philippines, mm -hmm. and he created a story around this, and he's doing a musical now. I don't know why. Yeah, me too. I'm very excited. <laughs> Even Pedro Costa is doing a musical. Everybody's doing a musical. What was with this motherfucking musical? <laughs> yeah, it's La La Land, but uh, in another way. But no. But it's interesting because of the surreality, maybe. This mm. musical style gives to the act of killing sometimes mm. in your film as well. Mm. There's the surreality in the, the double facedness of Narciso, some yeah. surreal elements. But mm. maybe you can also elaborate a bit on the repetition, on the role of repetition, because there is. A lot of repetition in repetition the Repetition is about fascism, you yeah. know, the bombardment, the, you know, mm -hmm. it's conditioning, you know. That's the very, very attribute of uh, fascism, bombardment, you know, it's like the, 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 the issue of conditioning until you're numb. Mm. You know, the lie becomes the truth, you know, it's apocryphal, you know. The evil becomes the God, you know. It's always a pattern, you know, you know. So mm -hmm. the repetition, the la 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 in the film mm -hmm. is very deliberate on my part to do it. Is that's the very fascistic attribute of the film. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe there is a, the last question or maybe you have more questions. Yeah, I would like to ask uh, one question which maybe fits uh, the fact that it's uh, probably the last question, but uh, regarding the end of the film, where the main character, the poet, is being handed a gun after he before had said that he would kill himself after uh, the people would have told him what had happened to his, um, his girl. And yeah, and so the last image we see is him holding the gun, and I would like to, to ask you what yeah, how would you imagine, uh, would it go on, uh, or why did you decide to, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a perfect ending, of course, but you're still asking how, how you think it would go on, it will go on? I 
don't know how I would describe the ending, but the first impulse to me is the commitment, you know, when he, he, he challenged the militia and the head of the military. That if you tell me the truth, and, and I'm going to roll my head up. You know, I'm going to you know, shoot my head. So, yeah, that's the first impulse of that last scene, you know, a commitment to the promise that, you know, if they tell you the truth, then I do my end of the deal. I will kill myself. But it's an open ending, you know, you don't know what's going to happen, you know. It can be, you know, you know, I will use the very pretentious word, semiotic. It can be very symbolic of what's going to happen. You don't want to know what's going to happen. So it's an open ending anyway. But me as a maker, I will throw it to you. What's your version of the ending? I don't know. I mean, it's, no, it's, your, it's your film now. <laughs> no, I, th I think it's, it's a yeah, great ending because it can, everything can follow. He can go on a... Can can yeah go and try to have some revenge. He can become, and, and, and anyway, it's, uh, I, th I think there is some kind of implication. Even, even if it's my work, you know, we can discuss on it forever. So you know, yeah. for me, when I do a film, when I do a film, when it's done, whoever embraces it, he owns it. She owns it. You know, I don't own the film now. It's it's yours now. So thank you, Olaf Diaz, for thank this you. conversation, and I wish you all the best for the future of this film. Thank you, and and uh, thank you to everybody for being part of the talents. <laughs>